Hey everybody, this week I want to show you the process I took in rebuilding my first amp from this to this. Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. I'm glad you've tuned in again. I want to start this video by reminding you all to subscribe down below and also hit that bell icon so you get all the notifications for my latest videos as soon as they come out. This week I've got a really cool video for you guys. It's something I've had in the vault for a while and it's the process I took to rebuild my first ever guitar amp. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of video of it, but I took tons of pictures during the rebuild. So I'm hoping you guys will enjoy this video and see all the steps that it takes to, uh, you know, go through the rebuild of, of something like this. A little bit of backstory first. Um, when I was in grade five, I believe it was, so back in 1995, I purchased my first guitar. I used money that I had saved up from my paper route and I was able to get a great deal on an HSS Samick Strat copy at a local music store as it was going out of business. I was super pumped to get this guitar and I couldn't wait to play it because, you know, I had always seen people play electric guitar and always just been fascinated by it. Well, anyway, I got it home and I started playing it and then I realized quickly that I needed an amp. Unfortunately, when I had just spent all my money on my guitar, I didn't have that extra money for an amplifier. Luckily for me, my parents were the nicest folks in the world at the time. Uh, even though they knew it was going to bring them probably hours of annoyance, they were able to get in touch with a local musician, a friend of the family, who had an old gigging amp, and they purchased that for me so I had something to plug my very first guitar into. So my very first amplifier was a solid state Yamaha G50 112 amplifier. So 50 watts and one 12 inch speaker. Uh, solid state, it had built in reverb and distortion, the three band EQ, uh, it had bright and presence. Uh, had a bunch of stuff on it, which I didn't know how to use when I was a kid, but I just thought it was awesome because it would make my guitar louder. Skip ahead to about seven or eight years ago when I purchased my first house. I had to clean all the junk out of my parents' house that had been left there, uh, you know, since I had graduated from high school and went off to university. So this amp had come back into my possession. Uh, now, between when I had, uh, you know, used this when I was a kid and when I got it back seven or eight years ago, I had, you know, dabbled with different amps. I, you know, had a Roland Microcube. I had actually gone out and bought my first tube amp, which is my Blues Junior that I play a lot of stuff through. And uh, yeah, so I knew a little bit about amps at that time, but I had never really looked into this amp that I had owned way back then. And you know, what I found when I looked at it was pleasantly surprising. So the main thing I found with this amp is, you know, I did some research and basically people were calling it the solid state uh, deluxe reverb. I can't really compare it, but you know, this is the forms I, I saw and they said a lot of gigging musicians back in the 80s would have used these as kind of their, their gigging amp or their um, you know, second amp, solid state, um, a little bit more reliable than maybe the tube amps. And it was set up very similar to how the Fender reverbs were at the time. Another cool thing that I found out about this amplifier when I was looking into it, actually looking inside of it, was that it didn't have the one 12 inch Yamaha speaker that was stock. Um, this gigging musician had actually modified this old amplifier to take two 10 inch speakers and those 10 inch speakers were the Fender JBL speakers with the orange back and I'll put a picture of those up here. Now I didn't know a lot about those speakers at the time but obviously I did some Google searching to see you know what kind of quality they were and I was pleasantly surprised to see that you know these are some pretty sought after speakers. Um, you know maybe not so much the 10 inch ones but definitely the 12 inch ones with the orange back. Uh, a lot of people had used these to replace these stock speakers in their Fender reverb. So again, that syncs up with this idea of being the solid state reverb uh, companion that Yamaha had built. So uh, I thought that was really cool. And, you know, my thoughts started uh, going off thinking, you know, this would be a fun project to do one day to actually clean this guy out, you know, check out the electronics, make sure everything was, was up to snuff and, you know, piece it back together. Skip ahead another six or seven years, I guess, until about a year ago when I decided, you know, I finally, uh, getting confident enough with woodworking and, uh, you know, I knew a lot about electronics and stuff at that point as well that I wanted to rebuild this amplifier. So what I first had to do was evaluate the cabinet 
it was in pretty rough shape. It had been beaten around quite a bit, not so much by me, but by the original musician who had it. Um, it had taken probably some, some water on as well. It, and it was in my parents' crawl space for a while. So I think the humidity had got to it and it was really heavy, like way heavier than it should have been. So I think there was a lot of moisture in the wood in the cabinet. So I wanted to rebuild that. Um, and I, I thought, you know, I can, I can do this. I've done some woodworking before, so it shouldn't be that bad. Also, I was able to track down the schematic for the electronics inside, which was a little bit tough. It, I went to the depths of Google to find this information, but equipped with that, you know, my knowledge of electronics and my background, I started pulling this amp apart and uh, looking at both the external and what I could do with the, you know, the outside, the, how it looked, the cabinet, the faceplate, stuff like that, and then maybe what I could fix with some of the uh, internal components. Uh, I had used this for quite a while. I'd broken the uh, the shafts off some of the pots. The distortion didn't work anymore, which I didn't know why. And although it said it had reverb, I don't know if the reverb ever worked on this. So uh, a couple things I wanted to investigate, and uh, I think I'm going to take you through most of that uh, right now. So the first thing I had to do was, uh, you know, start tearing down this amplifier. I had decided that I was going to rebuild the cabinet, so. You know, I, I needed to get everything out of there, set it aside so I could, you know, measure the cabinet up and make sure I had all the right dimensions. Um, this started by removing the back panel. Um, then I had to unhook the, the dual speakers there and pull out the actual amplifier or the electronics for the amplifier. That was no issue. Um, I noticed a few things right off. Um, first of which was the amplifier was just full of dust. Um, there was, you know, big mothballs in it, so I had to vacuum that all out. Uh, did a little bit of electronics cleanup on the electronics board, so that was just quick stuff that I probably should have done along the way anyway without ever having to, you know, rebuild an amplifier. Once I got the amplifier electronics out, I set those off to the side. I wanted to begin with my uh, build of my cabinet, so I had decided to go with just a straight pine cabinet. Uh, it was um, you know, one by 12 board. I had cut it to the same dimensions as the original cabinet, which was, you know, obviously made sense. Everything would fit back in perfectly. So uh, I wanted to, you know, do something really easy. Um, the way I attached them together was uh, just butt end joints. So if you're familiar with woodworking, I didn't use finger joints. I just butted them up. Um, I used wood glue to keep them together with some finishing nails to hold them while the glue set. This is going to be stronger than screws, uh, just from my own experience. So I'm very happy using glue here with the nails as a, as a kicker. So after I got the, you know, the four pieces for the exterior of the cabinet done, I had to uh, sand it all. I used 150 grit, I think maybe some 222, but that would have been overkill, uh, just cause I'm, I was going to Tolex this anyway, had to fill in some gaps with, uh, some wood filler, uh, especially where that, that angled piece meets the, the, uh, the top of the amp. Um, if you're familiar with any kind of deluxe reverb, they have that little angled piece kind of cut the corner off at the, the front top of the amp. So I had to do some sanding in there. Um, yeah, so pretty straightforward to build that. I used a half over router bit to route the outside of the edges to just make sure everything looked clean. Uh, and it gives it that same look as a, a Fender Reverb or you know that original Yamaha cabinet. The next thing I had to do was just create a face on the inside of the cabinet so I could screw in the baffle that held my two speakers. Um, this one was a little bit of an upgrade over the old baffle or the old face because uh, you know someone had just hacked it away with a jigsaw and you know the two speakers that they had put in place actually weren't open to air. Uh, there were you know some of the baffle was actually clo uh, closed off in front of it, so a little bit of an upgrade on the cabinet. Probably not much of a difference, but you know something I definitely took note of when I was building this cabinet out. Once I got the face glued in and a couple of extra support structures in there, I had built the shelf where the amplifier could sit as well. I got to the probably the most worrisome step of rebuilding this speaker, which was uh, Tolexing it. Um, I had sourced some Tolex from, I think it was Next Gen Guitars here in Canada. Uh, I wanted to do something a little bit different than the black Tolex and the gray grill that came with the, the stock Yamaha amp. So I went with a uh, Sonic, no, sorry, not Sonic Blue. It was Seafoam Green uh, Tolex. 
and a wheat grill. So uh, kind of cool look. Uh, I had some ideas what I was going to do with the faceplate at that point too, so I thought it would work really well. So when Tolexing your amplifier, uh, for me, I just use this, guy, this stuff here. Uh, this is LePage Heavy Duty Contact Cement. Uh, it worked really well. Um, I would definitely recommend doing it in a well-ventilated location. Um, the way it goes on is you will just, uh, you know, cut your, all your pieces of Tolex to length. So you should be doing that before you glue anything. Make sure you have mocked up, you know, all the lines you can draw on your, on your cabinet to make sure you have the right distances, uh, etc. with, with your Tolex. You want to have all those cut out and then you're going to piece by piece put the, uh, the cutout Tolex on with the contact cement. The way to do that is you just uh, brush it on. I used a paintbrush. So I brushed on my contact cement, a, a pretty healthy layer of it. You let it sit for a couple minutes just where it starts to get a little bit tacky. And then once it gets to be a little bit tacky, you're going to uh, press your Tolex down on it. And the way I did it was I kind of started at the top and then continually rolled it down and pressed as I went down. Um, it gives a firm seal pretty much everywhere. If you do run into some spots where there is a, uh, you know, a, a corner that might be sitting up a little bit or, you know, something that is, you know, the edge of it isn't sticking down, I would recommend using super glue and then just holding it there for a minute or so and those, those edges will stick. So the big thing about Tolexing is doing the corners properly. Um, I looked at, you know, some of the amps that I had and saw how they did the corners. I also mocked it up with just a piece of loose leaf so I could understand the cuts I would have to make, the 45s I'd have to make to get those uh, proper corners. And I think I did a pretty good job for the first time through building an amplifier. I'm gonna put some pictures up here. Obviously, you, you might be seeing them now. Um, but you know, it, if, you, if you really take your time, like I said, I used a piece of loose leaf and pretended it was Tolex and just you know, tried a couple different ways to cut it and then used that as a template for cutting my Tolex and I thought it worked really well. Um, you know, uh, again, you might get some little spots that, you know, stick up in the corners, maybe some little pieces that don't quite meet when you, you cut your 45s. Uh, I found that if, you know, if you just use a little bit of pressure uh, and some super glue, you can push those together and stick them down pretty close. Uh, wrapping the wheat grill really wasn't that much. I just built a small frame out of some strips of wood that I had. Uh, I used a staple gun to staple the wheat grill uh, onto the frame and then I used velcro from the baffle to my grill um, in three or four places so I could move that uh, take that on and off as needed. So the inside of the amplifier was a little bit of a different task this is more electronics than woodworking but it was still pretty fun. Um, the like the first thing I said uh, was you know actually just cleaning up the board so getting rid of all the dust with a vacuum cleaner cleaning up the electronics boards with some electronics cleaner, uh, just making sure you didn't have any dust or anything going on in there. Uh, the steps I took inside this board, uh, the first thing was to remove the old uh, neon lamp that was in there. I wanted to replace it with a more modern um, uh, jewel style lamp. Now I still kept a neon light bulb, but I rewired it so I had the, uh, you know, the T, three and one quarter bulb that is common on all your fender amps. Mind you, this is rated for the 120 volt AC bulb rather than the 6.3 volt DC bulb that's on your fender amp. So a uh, little bit different, but same style overall. I also replaced all the switches, all the input jacks. Uh, so, you know, my on off switch, my input output jack, and I did have uh, one or two broken potentiometers. So the shafts had been broken on my, I think my treble in my middle. I replaced those with some CTS pots that I had purchased from Next Gen Guitars as well. So at this point I was feeling pretty good. There was only a few other things I wanted to look into. Uh, the first thing I noticed when I, I, pulled the, uh, I pulled the board out was that uh, it had a uh, hardwired fuse, which I thought was really weird. So that was a simple change. I just bought a, um, you know, a fuse socket, I guess you would call it, and soldered that in in place of this. So if a fuse ever did break, I didn't have to actually solder to a fuse, which to me, I, I don't really know how they did that back then. I would have thought that the heat would have broken the fuse. But uh, yeah, that was something really easy to do, and it definitely makes it a little bit more, uh, a little bit more, uh, I guess, user-friendly for an electrician down the road. The other thing I wanted to look at was my distortion. Uh, like I said, I really wasn't getting any distortion with it. 
Um, I used my schematic. I backtraced the circuit and found the distortion really came down to two diodes that were pointing to ground. Inspected those diodes and one of them was burnt out. So no diodes, uh, you know, it's not going to distort like you want it to. I replaced the two diodes. When I got it back together, the distortion was working much better than it ever did. And I was super happy. So the next thing I looked at was my reverb. As I mentioned, you know, I was never able to get much reverb out of this uh, amplifier. So I wanted to see what was going on with it. Uh, it was interesting to see that the reverb tank here was an Accutronics 1A, which is a really short latency reverb tank. It was soldered directly to the board, so it didn't have the RCA hot swappable plugs. I quickly changed that, put in some plugs and jacks for the uh, uh, RCA hot swappable reverb tanks. Um, I looked at the existing tank that was in there when I peeled it off. Uh, you know, normally if you know anything about reverb tanks, there's, you know, two or three springs in it, depending on, you know, what kind of latency you want or how heavy the effect is. Um, this had, oh, I think was an originally a two spring reverb tank. There was one spring that was broken off inside of it. And the other one looked like it was rusted all the way out. So uh, I guess I was right saying that there was probably some moisture that had gotten into this. And I suspected that's why I never got my reverb. I replaced the reverb tank with a Accutronics 3A reverb tank, I think it was. Uh, three meaning that it was just the longest latency that Accutronics had put out. Uh, it was three springs as opposed to the two springs that was in there. So I was looking for really a, a huge bump in reverb on this one. Finally, I wanted to do something with the faceplate. You know, this had an old metal faceplate. A lot of it had been scratched off. Even the faceplate was bent. So I wanted to figure out a cheap and easy way to, you know, upgrade the look of the front of the amplifier. Uh, the first thing I did was, uh, you know, replace all the knobs on there. I had placed uh, white chicken head knobs on. I think it gave a really cool look um, the, to go along with, you know, all the new hardware that was in there for the, you know, the jacks and the switch as well. So none of that rusted chrome stuff. And finally, uh, I was able to come up with an idea for creating a new faceplate. This is just a sticker that I had uh, created in paint.net, similar to how I do my pedal graphics. Uh, I was able to get this the exact size I wanted um, through, I think it was called Sticker Mule online. I'd order five of them, but it was still, I think, only 10 bucks. Um, this is, you know, kind of my own uh, take on the nameplate. And what I did is I just stuck this to a piece of plexiglass and drilled out the holes on my drill press and boom, I had a new faceplate. Uh, there was never wrinkling in the sticker, which was really good. It looks great really. And, and you'll see that in a bit here. So talked about the cabinet, talked about the Tolexing, talked about the electronics inside. Last thing to talk about was the speakers. Um, they were actually in really good shape. Um, there was a little dent in one of the cups on uh, one of the 10 inch speakers. I did the old uh, shop vac trick to pull that dent out. Uh, didn't break anything, didn't rip anything in the cup. So I, I was quite happy with that and uh, tested them out. Everything, everything seemed to be working fine. I didn't muck around with how they had went from a, a 112 to a 210 or the, you know, the impedance matching there. Uh, it looked like everything was proper, you know, but uh, uh, I will defer to the original person who had set this up and, uh, you know, used it for years and years and years without blowing it up. So I was good to go there. So without further ado, I want to show you guys this amp, show you what it can do. It's a reverb machine now. It's got great distortion. It goes great with, you know, my new Jazzmaster uh, or any real guitar. I, I like using it for, you know, really kind of distorted stuff. Uh, I think that's usually where my thought goes when I go to solid state amps anyway. But uh, yeah, hopefully you guys enjoy it and hopefully you guys like the pictures I put up there to uh, show you the, uh, the whole process I went through in rebuilding this guitar amplifier.
So that's it for me this week. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, make sure to subscribe, hit the notifications bell, and we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot.